Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Laura Berner will present Self-Control Gone Awry, the Cognitive Neuroscience Behind Bulimia Nervosa. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds the most innovative ideas in neuroscience and psychiatry to better understand the causes and develop new ways to treat brain and behavior disorders. These disorders include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and schizophrenia. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $418 million to fund more than 6,000 grants around the world. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Laura Berna. Dr. Berna is Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. She was a 2020 Young Investigator grantee. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Berna's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time. Following the presentation, I'll ask as many as are possible in the time allotted. And now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Berna. Laura, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me to present. It's really an honor to be able to tell you about our investigations of the brain self-control circuitry and the role that we think it plays in bulimia nervosa. I just wanna check in to make sure you can see my slide okay before I get going. Yes, certainly, thank you. Okay, great. All right, so to accomplish these aims, um, I really have to make sure that we start off by getting all on the same page about what bulimia nervosa is and what self-control is. And then I'm gonna tell you about what we've learned so far about self-control in bulimia nervosa, both at a brain-based and behavioral level, and how that helps us better understand symptoms of the disorder. And then I'll tell you a bit about what all of this might mean for designing better treatments and give you a bit of a preview of some research coming attractions, including the focus of my ongoing BBRF Young Investigator Award project. So let's start with the key behavioral features for diagnosis of bulimia nervosa. This disorder is really defined by two key behavioral symptoms. The first is recurrent episodes of binge eating. Binge eating in turn is defined by um, two main behaviors. So there's eating a large amount of food in a discrete period of time, but just overeating alone isn't enough to get a diagnosis of binge eating. You also have to experience a sense of loss of control during the episode. Um, and patient descriptions of this subjective experience really vary from person to person, but in general it includes things like feeling driven or compelled to eat, not feeling able to stop eating once one has started, not being able to keep oneself from eating large amounts of certain kinds of food, or even giving up on trying to control eating because it feels too chaotic or it feels like no matter what, a binge eating episode is going to occur. The other key behavioral feature that we see with this disorder is recurrent compensatory behaviors. Um, so this can include things like self-induced vomiting, laxative, diuretic, or medication misuse, or excessive exercise, even in some patients, fasting behaviors. Um, and many of these compensatory behaviors can also often feel out of control to patients. So overall, you can see that this illness is really defined in many ways by the ingestion and the elimination or the expulsion of food in a way that can feel out of control. And research suggests that both of these behavioral clusters of symptoms are between 46 and 72% heritable, which really highlights that these behaviors are not just about societal pressure to look a certain way, but that they have very powerful underlying biological components driving them. Now to bring that point home even further, the behaviors of bulimia nervosa were described as early as 780 AD. So for example, Avicenna's Canon of Medicine 
um, a really very old, as you can see, historical document, um, talks about prescribed vomiting for eating in excess and monthly vomiting for weight loss. So these are really compensatory behaviors that were normalized at the time, even prescribed. But l later on, not too much later, there are several accounts of saints in the Middle Ages who engaged what were even then conceptualized as disordered eating behaviors. For example, St. Veronica, who reportedly restricted her intake, snuck into the kitchen in the, the middle of the night to binge eat and engaged in excessive compensatory exercise. So these behaviors have really been around for centuries, whether they were sort of culturally condoned or not. But the official term bulimia nervosa wasn't coined until 1979, when Gerald Russell published his seminal paper, Bulimia Nervosa, an ominous variant of anorexia nervosa. The disorder was added to our DSM, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, as an official diagnosis the following year, which is why I think a lot of us think of um, bulimia nervosa and maybe eating disorders in general as a relatively recent phenomenon. But again, hopefully understanding this history gives us another view to this, another indication that really maybe there's something going on here that's independent of today's thin ideal standards. And hopefully after showing you lots of brain imaging data today, I'll convince you of that even further. So who are affected by bulimia nervosa? Um, well, the disorder is four to 10 times more prevalent in females than in males, but these sex-based ratios really don't also capture the fact that transgender folks are much more likely than their cisgender counterparts to engage in bulimic behaviors. In terms of age, um, the median age of onset is 18, so slightly older than the onset of um, another eating disorder, anorexia nervosa, which tends to onset a bit earlier. And between 1 and 3% of the population will struggle with bulimia nervosa at some point in their lifetime. However, recent data are suggesting that rates of bulimia nervosa are rising in the U.S. with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly among teens. And when we think about subthreshold symptoms of the disorder, one in five women in the U.S. say that they've experienced episodes of binge eating, and one in three have made themselves vomit or taken pills to try to lose weight. So a pretty alarmingly high rate of um, bulimic behavior engagement in our population. It's a disorder that's associated with pretty pronounced disability. So 78% of people with bulimia nervosa say that their disorder is um, causing at least moderate levels of um, impairment in their everyday life. And uh, the disorder also comes with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and mortality in adults as well. In terms of the course over time, it typically persists for several years, um, but the course is relatively varied. So some folks are able to recover successfully, some have intermittent courses with repeated bouts over the years, and some have really chronic and persistent courses of illness. And we can't yet predict particularly well who will go on to develop a chronic course, but we do know that individuals who struggle with self-control in multiple areas, like binge eating and purging and shoplifting, for example, are more likely to have the chronic and unremitting symptoms. So keep that in mind as we keep talking about self-control in today's talk. How do we typically treat bulimia nervosa now? Um, well, first-line interventions for the disorder include cognitive behavioral psychotherapy and medication. For example, enhanced cognitive behavioral therapy for eating disorders focuses first on trying to help folks normalize their eating to eliminate restriction, which is seen by this treatment as something that can make out-of-control behavior like binge eating and purging more likely. And second, it focuses on a different kind of control, which is emotion regulation, um, so difficulties regulating emotions and how those might set off binge eating and purging episodes is addressed next. In terms of pharmacotherapy, um, fluoxetine is an SSRI that's FDA approved for the treatment of bulimia nervosa. I think it's still the only medication that is FDA approved for this indication. Um, and it's considered another first line intervention for the disorder. And often these two treatments are combined. But unfortunately, over 60% of patients who receive first line treatments for the disorder still have symptoms. So this really highlights an urgent need for us to identify the brain-based mechanisms that might maintain these symptoms so we can develop better, inter better interventions and then interrupt these cycles of binge eating and purging that folks are still struggling with. So if we want to understand mechanisms, one big question is, how is it and why is it that these individuals get stuck in these out-of-control behaviors? 
How is it that even the most motivated patients in treatment will often describe having the thought right before or while they're binge eating and purging that they want to stop, that this isn't consistent with their long-term goals or their values, but they feel like they just can't? Well, to understand that, first we have to understand more about the construct of self-control. The construct of self-control or self-regulatory control in the literature continues to be refined. Um, it's really required for many everyday actions for us to coordinate the decision to execute one behavior and inhibit another. It's really an umbrella term, hence the large orange umbrella, that may subsume a number of processes, including inhibiting a pre-planned motor response, selecting a response, keeping track of whether there's a conflict, for example, between a goal and your behavior, keeping track of whether you've made a mistake or an error and adjusting that behavior accordingly. And the concept of self-regulation broadly also includes the ability for us to control our emotional responses and to regulate our attention as well. Today, we're gonna to be focusing primarily on the control of behavior and cognition. And the circuitry that helps us control our behavior and attention connects various parts of our prefrontal cortex, which is shown in this top brain in green and yellow and red, our parietal cortex, which is highlighted with a purple circle in that top brain, and the motor strip in our cortex, which is shown in blue, to a set of structures deep within our brain um, called the basal ganglia that's made up of the caudate, putamen, and pallidum. And you can see the basal ganglia from a different view here um, in the lower right of the screen. You can see how it sits sort of in the middle of the brain. These regions communicate with the cortex in part through the thalamus, which you can see in the bottom half of the figure to the left. Um, so this is definitely a simplified um, illustration of the circuitry involved, but I want you to get a sense of the key players that are involved in helping us control our behavior. So our next question is, how does self-control and the circuitry that supports it go awry in bulimia nervosa, and how could these disturbances promote bulimic symptoms? Well, first I wanna tell you about some of our work that's focused on how potential alterations in the structural anatomy of circuits that support control might play a role in bulimia nervosa. The data that are shown here are from high resolution anatomical MRIs. So we take a picture of the structure of the brain that were acquired from 60 adolescents and adult females with bulimia nervosa and 54 matched controls between the ages of 12 and 46. And we pooled data across um, three fMRI studies conducted at Columbia um, to get a large sample size so we could really get a sense of what's going on in the brains of folks with bulimia nervosa. We found, which you see here, that controlling for age, so across all ages, that there were cortical thickness reductions in the areas that you see in blue. So the right lateral prefrontal cortex, or the pars triangularis, so that's in the front of your brain, kind of off to the side, and the right superior parietal cortex, which is labeled SPC in the image that you see here. So we see frontoparietal cortical thickness reductions in bulimia nervosa across all ages, so two key regions that were highlighted in that brain circuit diagram that I showed you. And we also see that the frequency of binge eating, which is abbreviated here as OBE, or objective bulimic episodes, um, on the x-axis of all of these graphs, was associated with cortical thickness in these frontoparietal attention network regions. So we see that the thickness of the left rostral middle frontal gyrus, the right pars triangularis and pars opercularis, so these lateral prefrontal cortical areas, and the thickness of the right inferior parietal cortex was all inversely related to binge eating. So more binge eating, thinner cortex in these regions. We also looked at associations with loss of control eating episodes of any size in the past month, since teens with the disorder might not have as many objectively large binge eating episodes because they might be early in the onset of the illness or because they're younger, their episodes just happen to be smaller. And we found that the frequency of any loss of control over eating in the past month was inversely associated with cortical thickness in the bilateral insula. So this is a region that's involved in a host of functions from taste and emotion processing to more general processing of body signals, as well as, you guessed it, inhibitory control. So all functions that are relevant to bulimia nervosa. And so with more loss of control eating, we see less cortical thickness in this region. Overall, the story is suggesting that with greater illness severity, 
there are more pronounced frontoparietal cortical thickness reductions in bulimia nervosa. In a next step study that followed teens with and without bulimia nervosa over three years, we again found cortical thickness reductions in the lateral prefrontal cortex, so that front side part of the brain, as well as the medial prefrontal cortex, which is, as it sounds, in the middle front part of the brain, that were apparent early in the course of the illness, and interestingly, that persisted over time. So in each of these graphs that's popping up on the screen, the bulimia nervosa group is shown in blue dashed lines, and the controls are shown in red. And you can see a relatively stable reduction in cortical thickness over time compared with healthy controls. We also tested how cortical thickness might change with symptoms over time. But we found that on average, participants with the least cortical thickness in these prefrontal regions engaged consistently in more frequent binge eating and self-induced vomiting. We didn't find any within subjects effects that might have suggested that when symptoms happened to be worse, cortical thickness was getting thinner, but when symptoms got better, cortical thickness was thicker. Cortical thickness wasn't really tracking with symptoms in a state-based way like that. Um, we saw more stable cortical thickness reductions. Of course, these could represent a scarring effect of having engaged in bulimic symptoms over time. It could be sort of influencing the structure of the brain. Um, but because we detected these cortical thickness alterations so early in the course of the illness, it may be that we're also detecting a trait marker of bulimia nervosa, one that potentially contributes to its development and persistence over adolescence and into young adulthood. So, so far I've shown you a pretty consistent story of um, what's happening with cortical thickness in the cortical aspects of these circuits, but what about the structure of the subcortical aspects? Some prior studies have looked at alterations in the overall volume of these subcortical structures, but we looked at localized shape of these structures using vertex analysis or shape analysis. This method is a little bit different. It allows us to compare the subcortical morphology across groups with more precision and sensitivity to detect more subtle regional and localized differences than some volumetric approaches allow for. And at the subcortical level, we found um, shape inversions on the surface of the right pallidum. So that's one of those structures that I highlighted that's part of the basal ganglia more in the center of the brain. In the areas in this figure shown in purple and in blue, individuals with bulimia nervosa showed concavities. So the shape of the structure is actually inverted in those areas compared with healthy controls. And you can see that these inversions are really on all sides of this structure, both internally facing and externally facing aspects of the pallidum. Now, the pallidum is really a critical component of basal ganglia pathways that control our actions. And projections from the striatum into the medial and the lateral, so the middle and the side aspects of the pallidum, comprise these two pathways, the direct and indirect pathways that are thought to mediate go and stop signals. The middle and anterior or front aspects of the pallidum project to the premotor cortex and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. That, um, and they're parts of the motor and associative circuits that help control our cognition and behavior that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. These front parts of the right and left um, lateral pallidum are specifically involved in helping us cancel actions that we might have already started to initiate or withholding responses as well. So inward shaped deformations of this front part of the globus pallidus or the pallidum could contribute to or result from altered action initiation and inhibition signaling and relate to a wide range of impulsive behaviors that we see in people with bulimia nervosa, including binge eating and purging. So we found that these abnormal concavities were most pronounced in individuals with the most frequent binge eating. Like many of the cortical thickness alterations that I showed you, these shape inversions both distinguished people with bulimia nervosa from healthy counterparts and were most pronounced in patients with the most frequent symptoms. Although we didn't find shape inversions compared with controls in other aspects of the basal ganglia, we did find that within the bulimia nervosa group, women with more frequent self-induced vomiting showed shape inversions relative to those with less frequent symptoms. These symptom-associated inward deformations or concavities were localized to areas of the dorsal caudate, so that's sort of the top 
part of the dorsal caudate and the dorsal putamen um, in the posterior aspects. Together, this is called the dorsal striatum that projects to the lateral prefrontal, so those front side parts of the brain, and premotor cortices, again, that are involved in helping us control our behavior. And interestingly, similar inward deformations on the surface of the dorsal striatum, like we see here in purple and blue, have been detected in trichotillomania, which is another disorder that's characterized by poor control over behaviors that people feel compelled to engage in. So overall, these findings suggest that dorsal and dorsal striatal and lateral pallidum structural abnormalities may relate to impaired control over eating behaviors and urges to self-induced vomiting in bulimia nervosa. We don't know if these structural alterations in general reflect some sort of premorbid abnormal neurodevelopmental process, so if these parts of the brain are maturing abnormally. Um, or if they reflect synaptic loss, so problems at a neuron-based level um, where, where synapses are um, sort of dying off or getting lost, or both. But so far, we've seen that cortical thickness reductions and inward shape deformations um, in structures that make up self-control circuits really seem to characterize bulimia nervosa. But assumptions about the functional implications of these structural alterations are really only speculative. So our next big question is, do individuals with bulimia nervosa show abnormal functioning within these self-control circuits? Now, I should say now that really relatively few neuroimaging studies have focused on bulimia nervosa at all. Um, and only three fMRI studies, to my knowledge, so studies that have used functional magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging to study bulimia nervosa, have explicitly focused on self-control in this disorder. Two of those three studies have really focused in, in on control in the context of conflict and have used a task called the Simon task to do so. So what is this task? Well, I want you to imagine that you're lying in the scanner, like this cartoon blue person, and you see arrows presented on the screen. And you're supposed to press a left or a right button to indicate the direction that the arrow is pointing. Now, if the arrow um, is pointing in a direction that matches the side of the screen that the arrow is presented on, it's relatively easy to select the correct response, which is the left button. But on incongruent trials, when there's a conflict or a mismatch between the arrow and the side of the screen that it's presented on, it takes some self-control to process that conflict and override the urge to press the button that matches the side of the screen that the arrow is on and instead press the left button, which is the correct response in this case. So when women with bulimia nervosa completed this task in the scanner, they didn't perform as well as controls. They had trouble engaging control to do well on the task and they showed less activation in many of the regions where we found structural differences. So here we're looking down on the brain from above, and we can see that the bulimia nervosa group is showing less activation in the areas that are shown in red. So the lateral prefrontal cortex, which is labeled here as the IFG, or inferior frontal gyrus, the putamen, which we saw before with structural abnormalities and pallidum, as well as the cingulate, which is a region of the cortex that's particularly involved in processing conflict. In a next step study that I worked on focused on adolescents, we found similar reduced activation in lateral prefrontal cortex, the putamen, the pallidum, and the cingulate, so really similar regions of the brain, um, and really similar regions to where we found structural alterations. And in both groups, this lower activation was associated with more frequent symptoms. So it seems that individuals with bulimia nervosa have trouble effectively recruiting this circuitry to help them control their behavior. But this kind of reduced activation has also been found on tasks like this in other psychiatric disorders where control seems to be the problem, for example, like ADHD. So it doesn't really help us understand much about what might drive specifically bulimic symptoms and the discontrol of eating. And it's important for us to remember when we're trying to understand the control of eating in bulimia nervosa that yes, this is a disorder that's characterized by out of control binge eating and purging like self-induced vomiting. But on the other end of the self-control spectrum, many individuals with the disorder, these behaviors alternate with prolonged periods of pretty excessively and rigidly controlled eating like dietary restriction or even fasting behaviors in some individuals. So folks with a disorder go through some pretty dramatic pendulum swings of body state changes. 
And because of that, my more recent work has really focused in on how changes in internal and motivational states may abnormally influence self-control and decisions to engage self-control in individuals with bulimic symptoms. So first, I wanna tell you about some work that we've done to try to understand how the brains of people with bulimia nervosa might abnormally process one particular kind of body state change, which is unpleasant body state changes. So what does this have to do with self-control and with symptoms? Well, first, some of the dramatic body state changes that I highlighted on the last slide involve unpleasant internal experiences like extreme fullness or in some cases hunger, um, the pain of self-induced vomiting for some folks, and pretty dramatic fluctuations in emotional state, which we know also comes with big body state changes as well. We also know that the avoidance of unpleasant internal experience and the tendency to act impulsively and with little control in response to unpleasant internal experience are highly predictive of bulimic symptoms and their severity. And some data from non-eating disorder samples suggests that training inhibitory control actually reduces brain reactivity to aversive stimuli. So overall, we have some good reason to believe that particularly for folks with eating disorders, problems with control might be closely linked to how the brain is processing unpleasant body state changes. And in this next study, we asked whether alterations in how the brain anticipates and processes unpleasant body state change could play a role in bulimia nervosa. Now to study this in the scanner, we used a task that has nothing to do with eating. It's an inspiratory breathing load paradigm. Participants wore a nose clip and breathed through a tube during the scan, and periodically a plug would be inserted into the tube, making breathing feel more difficult. Importantly, we weren't totally eliminating the ability to breathe, so people weren't holding their breath, it just felt more difficult to breathe. Um, and that experience would last for 40 seconds at a time. Because that breathing load or that breathing restriction period is relatively long, um, 40 seconds is a very long stimulus for an fMRI study in particular. We can examine how the brain is responding to this unpleasant change in body state over time. And in addition, because a visual cue signaled to participants when there was a one in four chance that their breathing was about to be restricted, we could look at how the brain anticipated and um, sort of prepared for this unpleasant body state change. What did we find? Well, during the anticipation of upcoming breathing restriction, women who had a history of bulimia nervosa showed hyperactivation in several areas. They showed increased activation in the amygdala, which you may know is a region of the brain that's integrally involved in fear and emotion and pain and reward processing, as well as the putamen, which we've already heard about, the insula, which we also heard about related to cortical thickness, and the superior frontal gyrus and anterior cingulate, regions of the cortex that have been more classically implicated in self-control. And this sort of anticipatory hyperactivation is actually consistent with what's been found um, in other studies using this exact same paradigm in major depression, in folks with elevated anxiety, and in individuals um, who score low in resilience on a self-report measure. Um, interestingly, it's the complete opposite of what we see in individuals who have a history of anorexia nervosa with no history of any binge eating. Um, so people whose eating disorder is really characterized by over-controlled, rigidly restricted intake of food. We also modeled the time course of activation over the course of this long, unpleasant body state change and found different patterns in healthy controls and in women with a history of bulimia nervosa. Whereas healthy controls showed a gradual rise in activation that peaked at the offset of breathing restriction and then returned to baseline, women with a history of bulimia nervosa showed this abnormal early spike and then a decline in activation over the course of the prolonged aversive experience. Here we see that pattern in the left posterior insula, which is a region of the brain that's involved in internal body state signal sensing and in processing but we also saw a similar decline in activation in the lateral prefrontal cortex, that region showing up again, um, and in the cingulate cortex, which are regions more classically implicated in control. This decline in activation is actually consistent with what's been found in some studies using other aversive imaging paradigms in post-traumatic stress disorder, 
which is another disorder characterized by reduced self-control, and one that actually happens to be quite comorbid with bulimia nervosa. Those two disorders tend to present together quite frequently. Um, and again, this is the opposite to the time course pattern that we have seen in another study in women who had a history of anorexia nervosa. So they show a steep rise in activation over the course of the aversive experience, while people with a history of bulimia nervosa show this decline in activation over the course of the experience. We also wanted to see if this aberrant activation was related to symptom severity, and we found that it was. So this heightened anticipatory activation in the amygdala um, was related to more frequent self-induced vomiting in the past. Now, of course, again, this could be a scar of having engaged in more vomiting in the past, but what we also might have detected is more of a trait-like alteration, a hyperactive anticipatory signal for unpleasant body state changes, maybe even like fullness, that promotes behavior like self-induced vomiting. So I wanna summarize what I've showed you so far. I've showed you that self-control circuits are structurally altered in teens and adults with bulimia nervosa, particularly those with the most severe symptoms. Teens and adults with bulimia nervosa insufficiently engage self-control circuits to control their non-food specific behavior. And bulimia nervosa is linked to brain hyperactivation when anticipating an unpleasant body state change. But this abnormal decline in activation, particularly in control-related regions, when experiencing an unpleasant change in body state. So what might this mean for treatments? Well, maybe by now you've detected a common thread across all these findings that I've showed you so far. It really seems that the lateral prefrontal cortex, particularly the right lateral prefrontal cortex, keep showing up again and again as a region that's altered structurally and functionally in bulimia nervosa. And it may be a useful target for neuromodulatory interventions like transcranial magnetic stimulation or transcranial direct current stimulation, interventions that can help increase activation in this region. Some data also suggests that inhibitory control training um, programs can improve performance in healthy individuals by enhancing preparatory activation in this region. And there are some preliminary findings that indicate that inhibitory control training programs like this might help patients with bulimia nervosa engage control over their eating behaviors. So whether it's a neuromodulatory intervention or a neurocognitive training program, treatments that could ramp up and help sustain activation in this region might be helpful for bulimia nervosa. What about new avenues for medication and or psychotherapy? Um, well, I want to show you some pilot data of ours that suggests that the combination of mood stabilizing medications with behavioral treatments may also be promising, um, given what it looks like their effects are on self-control circuits. So um, this is a resting state scan from one patient who had severe bulimia nervosa and was scanned after receiving an intensive cognitive behavioral intervention. This intervention is focused specifically on increasing skills for behavioral and emotional self-control, and this treatment is called dialectical behavior therapy, or DBT. What you see here is connectivity within a frontoparietal control network. So um, this is connectivity between regions in that circuit that I showed you way at the beginning of the talk. The arrows represent functional connections between regions, and the thickness of the arrows indicates the strength of the connections, in this case, after three weeks of dialectical behavior therapy. Here is the same patient's brain again after 17 weeks of DBT, so more DBT, but with the addition of a stable dose of lamotrigine, um, a mood stabilizer that some of our case series data suggests may be helpful in reducing symptoms, particularly in patients with severe dysregulation and bulimia nervosa, those patients that I told you about that tend to follow a more chronic course of illness. And hopefully you can see with your naked eye that there are more connections on the right and stronger connections within this frontoparietal network on the right. This patient was fully abstinent by her second scan, and it's possible that the combined treatments increase in self-control circuitry connectivity contributed to this symptom remission. Of course, huge caveats, this is data only from one patient scanned twice, so we need large randomized controlled trials to really determine um, that the treatment was affecting the brain change that we see. 
But to my knowledge, no studies to date have scanned individuals with bulimia nervosa before and after a treatment intervention like this. And these are promising initial results to support the combination of mood stabilizers and behavioral interventions in enhancing self-control circuit function in bulimia nervosa. So what's next for research, particularly research that's still trying to understand um, mechanisms that drive bulimic symptoms? Well, for many reasons, I think it's important that we remember and turn back to the fact that every day, multiple times per day, our brains have to bring together information from our bodies and our environments to control our eating behavior in order to really help us survive. So it's a critical function. In turn, our eating or not eating influences our brain self-control circuitry, creating this sort of feedback loop. Now, I've showed you data so far focused on modeling unpleasant body state changes that might be analogous to those that occur in the context of eating disorder behaviors. But really, in order for us to understand what might be going on in eating disorders, it would be helpful to understand what goes wrong with the control of eating and how might food intake actually influence the brains of people with eating disorders in a different way. So I'll tell you next about some work that we've been trying to do that um, uses new tasks and state-specific designs to get at some of these questions. First, I'll show you some work that's currently under review that addresses the fact that relationships between brain activation and the impaired control over eating that uniquely characterizes bulimia nervosa remain pretty unexplored. We wanted to understand whether the brain is uh, ineffectively recruiting this circuitry specifically when the demand is to control eating behavior, not a button pressing behavior necessarily. So we had participants with bulimia nervosa and healthy controls complete two tasks. One was a standard go no go task. So in this computerized task, a participant um, is instructed to withhold a button pressing response when they see a no go cue of some type, in this case, the letter X but to press a button as fast as they can without making mistakes when they see some sort of go stimulus, in this case, any letter that isn't an X. So you can see this cartoon participant withholding the button pressing response when an X pops up on the screen. It becomes difficult to inhibit button pressing because the no-go stimuli are pretty rare, and the number of times that a person presses when they're not supposed to press serves as an index of deficits and control. Now this task might remind you a bit of the button pressing Simon task that I showed you before um, and has the limitations of really involving a behavior that isn't very closely linked to eating behavior. So to objectively measure potential eating specific deficits and inhibitory control that could uniquely drive bulimic symptoms, I developed a novel eating go no go task that requires the inhibition of a prepotent tendency to sip and swallow a tasty yogurt shake during no go trials. So the stimuli are the same, the no-go cue is still an X, the go cues are in this case non-X letters, and in response to go cues, the participant has to sip and swallow this strawberry yogurt shake that's been used in lots of studies of laboratory binge eating and bulimia nervosa before, but when they see a no-go cue, they have to withhold this ingestive response. So this affords us a way to objectively quantify potential problems controlling eating-specific behavior in individuals with eating disorders. And while participants were completing each of these tasks, we measured activation in the prefrontal cortex using a portable imaging technology called functional near-infrared spectroscopy, or FNIRS. This technology measure, measures changes in oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin concentration um, and with this model just in the pre prefrontal cortex. Um, and these changes are very similar to the bold signal that's measured by fMRI. In fact, this technology has been cross-validated with fMRI using go-no-go -no -go tests specifically, so we know this technology can detect activation in the same regions of the prefrontal cortex that fMRI can when somebody's doing a go-no-go -no -go task. But this technology is really helpful for monitoring brain activation during eating. In fMRI, participants have to lay down, they have to stay very still, or our signal gets very noisy. But with FNIRS, participants can move around, they can sit upright, they can engage in naturalistic behavior like eating. So our findings from these methods are still under review, 
but as a bit of a preview, we found that women with bulimia nervosa were less able to control their eating responses on the eating go no go task compared to healthy controls. They also had problems controlling their button pressing responses, just like the adults in the fMRI study using the Simon task, um, had slightly more difficulty controlling their eating responses. And we found that women with more severely dysregulated eating in the past month were not able to effectively recruit um, medial, so those middle front parts of the brain, or lateral prefrontal cortical areas, those side front parts of the brain, to inhibit eating. Um, and I'll show you some um, unthresholded effect size maps. So we're not sort of correcting for multiple comparisons here. This is just showing effect sizes across the entire prefrontal cortex. Um, the, these effect size maps are thresholded at small effect sizes in red colors and go up to large effect sizes in yellow. And you can see on the left that during standard task inhibition, the bulimia nervosa group is showing reduced activation with small effect sizes, so mostly red colors that you're seeing, but in medial and lateral aspects of the prefrontal cortex, so similar areas to what we saw um, in our study of adolescents with bulimia nervosa, where we saw cortical thickness reductions. During eating task inhibition, which we can see on the right, the bulimia nervosa group showed reduced activation with larger effect sizes and seemingly across more of medial and lateral aspects of the prefrontal cortex, so slightly larger effects on this eating task. And it may be that folks with bulimia nervosa have particular difficulty recruiting these regions to control their behavior in the context of eating. So some other important outstanding questions for our field. Well, first, um, I mentioned that most individuals with bulimia nervosa engage in both out-of-control binge eating and purging, and on the other end of the spectrum, prolonged periods of over-controlled restriction. So I'm particularly interested in how eating and not eating might influence self-control in bulimia nervosa in a potentially abnormal way. And second, our understanding of the cognitive neuroscience underlying self-control, particularly how we stop or inhibit our behavior, is pretty rapidly evolving. And findings over the last several years suggest that inhibitory control is about more than just pressing a button successfully or withholding a button pressing response. It's an adaptive process that requires moment to moment decision making about whether to engage in or stop a behavior, using experience to update your beliefs about how likely it is that you'll need to inhibit or stop your behavior in the next moment, constant tracking of how surprised you were about whether you had to engage control, um, and using that experience and that surprise to update your behavior and adjust it, and decision-making about whether trying to engage control is even worth the effort. We still don't know which piece or pieces of this complex process might go awry to promote bulimic symptoms, which makes it really hard for us to have very specific targets for treatment. So I'm tackling these last two questions using neuroimaging and neuroendocrine measures in my current work, and I want to wrap up by telling you more about the portion of this work that's funded by the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. This part of my work is really aiming to understand that that part of the self-control process where we make decisions about whether to spend cognitive effort exerting control. And the idea was born out of patients' descriptions of what the sense of loss of control over eating feels like. We can see in some of these example descriptions that decision-making about control seems to importantly change when a person moves from a fasted state to a fed state, so when they start eating. For example, I already blew it, I'll go for the whole thing. I already started, I'll just go all the way. If I tried hard, I could stop, but I just don't care. I know I can stop, but once I start, I'm not going to stop. So maybe starting to eat abnormally affects how people with bulimia nervosa calculate the estimated costs versus benefits of exerting control. Well, why would that be? It may have something to do with a gut-brain signal that involves a gut peptide called ghrelin. Ghrelin crosses the blood-brain barrier, so it goes into the brain to increase the transmission of striatal dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter, a signal in our brain, involved in helping us figure out how salient things are, and that seems to help encode how we value different courses of action. Ghrelin is best known for its involvement in regulating our appetite, glucose homeostasis, and energy metabolism, so it's really involved in pretty basic homeostatic functions important for all animals but it also plays a role in higher order functions like impulsivity and inhibitory control. What do we know about ghrelin and bulimia nervosa? Well, in healthy people without eating disorders, peripheral ghrelin 
normally increases before we eat to promote eating and then decreases after we eat. And you can see that pattern in this graph here um, in the line that's marked with the uh, filled in black circles. But women with bulimia nervosa don't show this after eating suppression of ghrelin. Instead, they show this elevated level of ghrelin that persists for at least 180 minutes after they eat. And these higher ghrelin levels correlate with more frequent binge eating and purging, but we don't know why. We don't know what the neurocognitive effects of altered ghrelin are. So my NARSAD Young Investigator grant is testing the notion that maybe eating via this prolonged and elevated ghrelin response that follows abnormally affects how people with bulimia nervosa calculate the estimated costs versus benefits of exerting control. Maybe that's why um, folks have this sense of loss of control over eating and the sense of like, I've already blown it, I might as well keep going and I'm not even gonna try to engage control. Specifically, we think that these high estimated costs of engaging cognitive, cognitive control after eating starts may result in out of control overeating and then subsequent purging behavior that can feel out of control as well. So to test this, we're um, studying folks with bulimia nervosa and healthy controls in two states. So we're studying them after an overnight fast and after a standardized meal. Um, and we're monitoring every half hour their levels of ghrelin in their blood in both states, and we're having them complete a neurocognitive task in both states. Um, this specific task measures cognitive effort discounting. So it asks people to make decisions about how much money would you have to be paid to exert different levels of um, cognitive control related effort. We can combine the behavioral data from this ta task with mathematical models called computational models that really help us pinpoint how individuals are making decisions in both states and how individuals with bulimia nervosa may be biased towards the costs versus the benefits of exerting control in different states. So these images are showing one particular kind of model like this called a drift diffusion model that models how people sort of arrive at their final um, choice selection of which thing they're going to do. Because a subset of these participants are also getting scanned in fasted and fed states as part of my NAMH-funded K-Award project, we'll also be able to explore how connectivity and control circuits in both fasted and fed states might relate to these state-specific changes in ghrelin and control cost estimates as well. So I'll leave you with a few parting thoughts. Um, hopefully by now I've convinced you that difficulty effectively engaging self-control circuitry may make eating and other behaviors feel out of control to people with bulimia nervosa. Um, treatment might be able to directly target this dysfunction, and it may not be even that we need brand new treatments, but that we can combine treatments that um, are already well established to help um, either enhance connectivity within these circuits or boost activation within particularly important regions or central nodes within these circuits. In the future, we think interdisciplinary research aimed at understanding the precise processes that drive under and over controlled eating behavior will help us better understand symptoms of this disorder as well as other eating disorders. And ultimately, um, it would be great for us to have longitudinal studies with very large sample sizes so that we can disentangle brain-based causes from symptom-related effects on the brain and really understand what is predisposing individuals to um, engage in bulimic behavior and what maintains these symptoms over time. Last, um, I want to provide you with some resources. So if you're in the Manhattan area and are interested in taking part in our research, please feel free to reach out to us um, in any number of the ways that are listed here on this slide. Um, if you're a researcher with structural scans of individuals with bulimia nervosa, please consider joining the bulimia nervosa working group of the Enigma Consortium. It stands for Enhancing Neuroimaging Genetics Through Meta-Analysis Global Consortium. Um, we're pooling data from groups across the world to summarize alterations in brain structure in people with bulimia nervosa. And the studies that I told you about already that were focused on brain structure still included large samples, but still included less than 100 participants. And we can really only start to answer questions about symptom heterogeneity and get findings that are more generalizable when we have big data to work with. So hopefully more to say on that soon. And if you're looking for helpful resources to learn more about eating disorders and clinical care, the resources at the bottom of the slide have rich information for patients and families, clinicians, and researchers as well.
Last, I'd like to acknowledge um, a host of collaborators, some of whom led the work I showed you today, and mentors and mentees across several institutions without whom this research definitely would not have been possible, the women who participated in the research, and finally, funding sources, particularly the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation. I'm especially grateful and excited to be taking um, these research questions to the next level, thanks to their support. Thank you for your attention. Laura, thank you for an excellent presentation and for the work that you're doing. Um, I, I think you did a great job showing the connection between some of the very basic kind of science and understanding of structure and uh, other brain activity um, and potential treatments. Uh, one, of, one of the uh, questions that we received relates to the issue of self-control and triggers. Could you speak a little bit about the types of things that might trigger somebody into um, the, the eating behaviors that you described? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think um, there's been a host of findings um, focused on cues that might make um, binge eating and purging behaviors more likely. So perhaps um, strongly learned associations between particular types of stimuli in one's environment, for example, um, might create strong sort of automatic feeling responses to those cues. So um, there could be, in terms of things that make binge eating and purging more likely, particular cues in one's environment, um, that somebody might feel triggers a binge eating and purging episode. Um, often, I think folks feel, and research shows that, high levels of negative affect or big swings in um, emotional state can actually uh, precipitate binge eating and purging episodes as well. Um, so for that reason, a lot of our treatments for bulimia nervosa tend to focus on trying to help folks regulate emotions um, too. Um, but I think um, this question is particularly interesting because um, it's really sort of where I think it's important for our research to go in thinking about are there particular, I guess I think of them less as triggers and more as states. Um, so are there particular emotional states, um, metabolic states, um, environmental related states that might make um, binge eating and purging more likely and if so, why? So is it that the brains of people with this disorder are actually responding in a different way to being in that state, um, which then makes it more difficult to sort of get out of this cyclical rut of binge eating and purging. Good, thank you. Uh, at the beginning, you spoke a little bit about the genetics, and I'd like you to say a little bit more about the genetics of this condition, and also if there is a family history of this condition, steps that people may take for their kids um, to, to hopefully reduce the risk of them developing the condition. Yeah, so a good question too. So um, there is a pretty strong genetic component um, to eating disorders in general, and bulimia nervosa is not an exception. Um, so again, I think for some folks that can be pretty validating to hear because it's even more evidence to support the fact that there is a true underlying biological contributor to what's going on. Um, and we do tend to see um, eating disorders travel in families. So often somebody will have a family member um, that they know of or maybe they don't know of that has struggled with an eating disorder um, at, at some point in their life. Um, so as you said, we know there's a pretty strong genetic component. In terms of steps to take um, sort of in, with a preventative um, idea in mind, I think in general, um, helping kids um, focus on, you know, normalized eating patterns, sort of at the beginning, um, having regular patterns of eating, eating regularly throughout the day, making sure that meals aren't getting skipped, snacks aren't getting skipped, um, not being particularly restrictive about um, food options or food choices, um, and uh, to the extent possible, modeling um, eating that is sort of normalized. So eating in a way where you're eating both because you're hungry and also because you're maybe enjoying um, the food that you're eating as well. So not just eating for nutrition, although that's certainly part of it, but eating in a way where 
um, you're also getting some enjoyment from food as well. Um, I think in general, sort of having helpful examples for kids of um, and models for kids of healthy eating can be really helpful. And so um, it can be helpful for if there are parents who are struggling with eating disorders um, to be able to reach out and get some treatment for themselves um, so that they can more effectively um, model that behavior for their kids. Um, that can be really helpful as well. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you, you mentioned um, during the period of COVID um, that there seems to be an increase in, in eating disorders and uh, in bulimia nervosa. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, I think that um, in terms of exactly why that's happening, there are a couple of, I guess, hypotheses about why that might be happening. Um, certainly as, uh, you know, teens are removed from their normal social environments and are kind of isolated a bit more, um, there are fewer activities to engage in that can be occupying and rewarding. Um, I think we have seen a lot of disruption in structure and routine. Um, certainly food environment has changed a lot in the context of COVID. Um, how often folks are around their kitchen has changed as well in the context of COVID. Um, so we're seeing um, an uptick in eating disorder symptoms really across all ages, I think. Um, I know eating disorder treatment centers have um, really received tons of calls in the context of COVID because a lot of folks are experiencing difficulties with these um, symptoms in the context of the pandemic. But I think um, it likely just has to do with how much it's changed um, everything about all of our structures and routines um, and environments and also has affected a lot of people's moods. I think um, Dr. Erica Forbes's talk um, for this same series did a nice job of highlighting how much um, kids' moods have been affected by the pandemic. Um, and she related that to reward functioning, but I think the same sort of rationale applies for understanding why eating disorder symptoms may have also been on the rise because um, so much has changed in terms of structure, routine, um, access to other things that might be rewarding. Um, there's also sort of an increased focus on um, the self, not a lot of other stuff to do, um, and maybe preoccupations with um, shape or weight might have more free time to sort of stew um, in the context of isolation and being in, in the pandemic. So I think for all of those reasons, we're likely seeing um, an increase. The one final question, often if a, somebody sees a loved one that they're concerned about, um, whether it be family or, or sometimes friends, peers, what's your advice? What should you do to try to get that person to accept help? That's a, a tough question because I think different people are um, open at very different levels to, as you say, accepting um, help that might be offered. Um, I think a great resource um, for people to reach out to is the NIDA helpline. Um, and folks can always reach out to that line. And it's not just for folks who are looking for treatment for themselves, but who are also um, loved ones or carers or friends um, or other folks who are in the lives of people who are struggling with eating disorders. Um, so their website and the National Eating Disorders Association hotline um, can be a great resource to have a sense of um, exactly what you can do, how you can inform yourself. Um, I think it's tricky because every eating disorder is a bit different. Um, and as I said, different people are sort of open to receiving treatment at different times at different levels. Um, some level of depending on the relationship with the person and how open the person might be. Um, you know, whether this is a parent, you might take a different approach that will be much more directive and assertive and wanting to get treatment for your kid right away. Whereas if you're more of a friend um, or somebody who's sort of observing what's going on, um, sort of bringing up what you've noticed and asking if it's something that they're open to talk about might be um, a more gentle approach that's kind of less confrontational. But in general, I think um, finding support and guidance for yourself on the topic, educating yourself about eating disorders um, and what you can do to um, help support folks in your life who might be struggling with eating disorders is an important first step.
Great. Uh, excellent, inv excellent advice. Um, I want to, again, thank you for your presentation and even more importantly for the work that you're doing, the work that you're go going to do um, in this very, very important area. So thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. Thank you so much. And thanks again to the foundation. I'm really, uh, again, very grateful to have their support to be taking all of this work to next steps. You're welcome, and we appreciate you doing the work um, that's so, that is so important. Um, I also want to thank everybody who joined us today. 100% um, of all donor contributions go for research, which is invested in our grants to the scientists. All of the research we fund is made possible through supporters like you. So please consider making a gift by visiting bbrfoundation.org or call us at 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with family and friends, please visit the events and webinar page on our website. I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Victoria Ricebro, professor in residence in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of California, San Diego, will present PTSD, Identifying Risk, Current and Future Interventions. This webinar will take place on Tuesday, September 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you again for joining us. We appreciate your support. Take care.